What's up, people? How are you doing? I'm back on, on with my Black Panther t-shirt. Can you guys hear me? Okay, just want to make sure I'm reading the comments. Can you guys hear me? It's been a while. Behold God. All right. I got to work on my narrow shoulders. Okay, so my voice coming in clear. Man, I went from 11 to 8. I guess I'm losing people. All right, that's fine. I don't know. Is Protestant reformer here or Protestant believer? I'm sorry. Okay, what's happening, everybody? What's happening? Wasabi. I was asked to answer this question in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. I, I looked at bits and pieces of it first and last. I, from what I could tell, one of the atheists was just super irrational. He was in a disgrace and embarrassment even to atheists, right? So really, well, there was no debate. Blessings. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I know she was. Hey, Protestant believers not here, huh? Sure. Sure, medic. How convenient. You're back in the hospital. Mm. What's up, Netta? How are you, sister? Good to see you again. Okay. No, but anyway. Whoever can stay can stay. Al Evans, Slim Sam. Well, I'm trying to get there. I'll, eventually, I will get my goal by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Flatten my stomach. Hopefully get some muscle mass in time. And keep it off until the Lord Jesus comes or takes me home, right? Just I'm still waiting for the word, the green light. Pray in the almighty name, matchless name of Jesus Christ our Lord. I get the word to relocate. I still need the word from the other side. Please pray for that. That in Jesus' name he'll grant me that grace. I'm ready to go. Yes. Bless you, brother. Good. Okay. Hey, what happened to Protestant believer? He's not here, huh? Okay. Well, that's that's Protestant for you. Always protesting. First, last, if he doesn't show up, can you post verses? Hey, what's up, Al? What's up, my pal? Pray for that green light to come. I'm still waiting for word, but I'm trusting by grace of the Lord Jesus, by faith in him, it's going to happen. So in Jesus' name, it's going to happen. Okay. Yep. Okay. It's like I want to leave in this month, but I may have to delay it till November, God willing, because I'm supposed to speak at certain places. It's it's just tiring. Good to see some of you. Hopefully, if I keep doing live streams by the grace of the Lord Jesus, by the permission of the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll eventually see a thousand like David, David's would. Yeah, I'm going to stay away from social media for a while, Revelation 22, 13. Pull back from social media. God willing, as the Lord Jesus compels me by his spirit, I'll be writing and doing live streams on YouTube. But I just want to stay away from Facebook for a while, right? Yep, it's Yom Kippurim. Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonements. Did you know in the Hebrew it's plural? It's Kippurim, not uh, Kippur. Yom Kippur, it's Yom Kippurim, plural. Kippurim, Day of Atonements, where the high priest atones for his family and atones for the nation. I don't know what's new tech networks. In time, in time. All right, folks. Hopefully the Lord Jesus will just refresh us by his spirit, fill us with his love and joy, refresh me and energize me and wash me in the blood of Jesus. Wash us in the holy, pure blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse us and purify us of our filth, of my filth. By the precious holy blood of the Father's beloved, the Father's heart, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. I really need the Holy Spirit to give me power to crucify my flesh, to die to my flesh, my carnal desires, and to crucify every stain of the flesh and just overcome and die to it in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's tiring, right? Because we're so accustomed to the flesh and walking in the flesh. May it never be. All right? It gets tiring, you know? But anyway, I think a Protestant believer checked out. He's not here. So we're going to have first last helping me to help you to glorify Jesus Christ. I'll probably do two live streams tonight. If God is pleased, if the Holy Spirit anoints me 
and saves me from my own hypocrisy. Destroy my flesh, crucify our flesh, Holy Spirit. Fill us with your life, with power from your presence, with fruit from your presence, with holiness and purity. Cleanse us, Holy Spirit, in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, please anoint me to speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. We are in love with you, Holy Spirit. We depend on you. Please save us. Save me from my flesh, from unrighteous anger, from impatience, from lust, from carnality. Please, Holy Spirit, just seal us for the glory of Jesus Christ. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Holy Spirit. You are the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son, one with them, in essence, and glory, and power, and honor, and majesty. Holy Spirit, we confess you are our God, our Lord, our love, our life, our Savior, the one who regenerates us, who, who refreshes us and rejuvenates us, who fills us with fruit for the glory of Jesus Christ. You are our creator, our sustainer, our provider, our life giver. And we love you. We are in love with you, Holy Spirit. We know that your, your role is to glorify Jesus Christ in us and give us the power to be like Jesus Christ. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help me. Save me from my hypocrisy, please. And Holy Spirit, have mercy on our loved ones. Seal our loved ones. Seal my daughters. Sanctify them. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Seal and preserve them for the glory of Jesus Christ, every one of us, Holy Spirit. And please, Holy Spirit, grant me the ability to recall Scripture, interpret Scripture correctly. Save me from error, stammering, and confusion, and fill my lungs and my chest and throat with health from your glorious presence. And bless your people for the glory of Jesus. We trust in you, Holy Spirit. You are the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son, the Lord and life giver. And we love you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, amen, amen. Yehovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Holy Spirit. All right. Say, so, hey, Christian, good to see you, man. It's been a while. You know, that inky specter looks a lot like Renee, but they're not the same person, right? Hopefully, we'll get over 100 for the glory of Jesus, not for fame or fortune. Good to see you, man. I'll be here for a couple more weeks. And in Jesus' name, by faith in you, Son of God, Lord Jesus, the door opens and I leave this place. And you'll bring my daughters to me. In Jesus' name, I believe that, Lord, for your glory. All right. Tony Petro, let me take care of him. 1611 on my way to heaven. Okay, so I'm going to answer this objection. I was asked to deal with it. Here's the objection. You pray for me now for clarity of thought and speech and that the Holy Spirit will destroy all distractions for the glory of Jesus Christ and surround us with a wall of fire from his sovereign presence. Let me share with you a true story, okay? I'm going to share a story with you to prepare us as the Lord Jesus saves us from the distractions of the enemy. Please, Lord Jesus, cover us by your blood and wash us in your blood. You ready to hear a true story of God showing himself real, that he is more real than we can imagine? You guys want to hear a story? Okay. Let me share a story with you guys. Pay attention to this. For years, and I need to start praying this again, let me give you the context, okay? I want everyone to hear how real our God is. We know he's real. He is reality, and Andrew is going to fall in love with the God who's real and loves him, who keeps bringing him to these sessions in Jesus' name, Andrew Martin. Okay, Al and everyone else, I want you to hear this true story. The Lord bears witness if I'm lying, okay? <clears throat> I had read in a book about a missionary in India. Now, remember, it's been years, and I'm sure I'm not going to remember the details exactly, right? Are you with me there? But from the best of my recollection, I was reading in this book that there was a Christian in India preaching the gospel. And there were some witches, local witches, who would contact spirits. And by the power of these evil, unclean spirits, do some miracles to deceive the people and keep them in bondage and fear. So they warned him. Okay, pay attention to this. I remember reading this distinctly. They warned him if he didn't stop preaching about Jesus Christ, that they would contact the spirits to pretty much kill him, to attack his family. And he told them they can do what they want. He was not afraid because he belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is greater than their spirits, right? So are you listening to me? I want you to pay attention because people wonder why I interact with the comment section. Let me repeat again. It's because I want to make sure you're following along with me, that you're understanding the issue. I'm not confusing you. 
Because as a teacher, I want to make sure you're understanding it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, they came back pretty much bowing before him and saying that we want to worship your God, Jesus Christ, after several weeks. Now, he was stunned. And he wanted to know why they had a change of heart. And here's what they told him. And I'm going to show you how it applies to me. True story, as far as I'm my my part of the story, right? For all I know, he probably made it up, but I have no reason to doubt his testimony because Jesus is real, he's alive, and he does miracles every day. All over the world, miracles are happening, genuine, bona fide miracles. And I'm going to encourage you to watch Lee Strobel's Case for Miracles. He came out with a book where he provides actual documented miracles, miracles that Jesus does till this day. And Craig Keener. A renowned New Testament scholar has a two-volume work documenting actual bona fide miracles taking place today. Okay, So watch Lee Strobel's Case for Miracles on YouTube. And amazing. He actually has two individuals who are miraculously healed. He interviews one and he plays the tape of the other who was miraculously healed during the recording of a session. So watch it. Lee Strobel. Case for miracles because Jesus is real. Okay, now watch here. He asked, he asked them what happened, why the change of heart. Now here's their story. They go when they contacted the spirits, when they contacted the spirits to attack him, they came back. The spirits came back to those witches and said, and these are when I say witches, I'm talking about witch doctors. They're males, not necessarily females. In Jesus' name, we rebuke the distractions. In Jesus' name, destroy the distractions, Lord, for your glory. All right. Now, they came back and said that the spirits came back to us and said that they could not reach you. They could not penetrate and enter your home because there were angels guarding your house. Are you listening? That's what they told him. There were angels guarding your house, so the spirits couldn't penetrate. So then they contacted even more powerful spirits. Pay attention to this. Spirits even more powerful than the ones they dispatched. Those spirits came back and said this. That's what they said. So this tells you these witch doctors were in actual contact with actual spirits. Right? Those spirits who are more powerful than the other spirits came back and said, not only were there angels surrounding the house, but there was a wall of fire surrounding the house. A wall of fire surrounding the house with angels. Are you with me there? A wall of fire. Okay. Now, how does that apply to me? Now, I'm going to tell you the part where I can bear witness and the Lord is my witness. Now, this part I can testify. This part I can testify the Lord bears witness. Because of that, I would pray every day and I need to start praying it again. Holy Spirit, surround me. At that time, I didn't have children. Surround me with a wall of fire from your presence. So I would pray, Father. Surround me with this wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, surround me with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. And I would pray that for years. And no one knew this is what I would pray. No one knew. Okay. One day at the center that I used to be a part of, what I would do, and Al Dariush knows. Al, you can confirm. I'm not going to mention the name of the center. But you, you can confirm that in the Chicago area, there was a Christian center outreach to Muslims. And I was part of it, right? And I had an office there. Al Dariush, a brother in the Lord can confirm because he's from my neck of the woods. He's here. See? Right there, he'll tell you. He's a witness to the center. Anyway, we'd have Christians coming to the center, and I would teach them about how to reach Muslims. Now, during one of these sessions, a group of young men and women came and laid hands and prayed for me after the session. Guys, pay attention to this. I hope I can find the card. I don't know if it's there. It's probably in one of my boxes. They wrote a card thanking me. Now, folks, one of the people, guys, pay attention to this. No one knows this is my prayer. One of the people wrote, <clears throat> she goes, Sam, I want you to know how the Holy Spirit protects you. As we laid hands on you and I looked at you, I saw a wall of fire surrounding you. And as we laid hands, that wall of fire came and surrounded us. That's how the Holy Spirit protects you. That's what she wrote in the card. Do you hear what I just said? Do you hear what I just said? I don't know. I don't think you caught it. I don't think you caught it. No one knew that's what I would pray every day. Every day I prayed, 
Father, surround me with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, surround me with a wall of fire from Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, surround me with a wall of fire. And I need to pray that again. I have stopped praying that. I don't know why. Okay. No one knew this is what I prayed in private. I never shared it with anyone. She wrote it without me telling her. And I remember it was a sister because I remember the name, right? That it was a female name, sister. Because this is how the Holy Spirit protects you. I saw a wall of fire surrounding you and it came and it surrounded us as we laid hands on you. How did she know that? And you're going to tell me it's a coincidence? Tell me it's a coincidence. Convince me that wasn't a, a real miraculous sign from the Holy Spirit to me. Convince me. Okay. In Jesus' name, I'm going to start praying that prayer again. No, she's she has nothing to do with pal talk. First, last, you're not listening and you're disappointing me and I'm going to hurt you. And then I'm going to repent. How can it be pal talk when I said it's the center and it's a group of students that came to hear me talk about Islam? You ever get that wrong again, I'm going to hurt you first, last. I know you think you're fit, you lost weight, you can fight. But I'm going to come personally and hurt you and then repent. Okay. You with me there? And Jesus, then I'm going to start praying that again. Okay. So that said, hopefully by the grace of God, we can get into it. Lord, please bring more people for your glory, right? Irene, because I like to hurt people. I know your name, Irene. It's in the Greek. It's Irene, meaning peace. There's nothing peaceful about this conversation, sister, so be careful. Watch yourself. All right. First, last, thank him. Pray for him. Pray the Lord Jesus blesses him. He has some issues that are private that he knows and God knows and he shared with few people. Pray God will grant him perfect health and provide for him and his mother and his family for the glory of Jesus. Protestant believer is not here, so he's going to be posting verses for us, right? He's going to be posting verses for us first and last. So thank him. He's another dear brother to my heart and he helps me to help you. I'm going to answer this objection. How can Jesus be God if he's the one mediator before the one God? All right. That was the question that someone asked me in the comment section, of one of the videos. And I said, I'll do a session on it. Right. Yeah, please hit the like button and subscribe. We got to make this YouTube uh, channel go viral. Why should David would have 400,000 that hater and the p stuff he, he posts is all mediocre. No, anyway, good to see you, Jeremiah. France, good to see you, everyone. Okay. Now. Are you with me now? 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. Ask the Holy Spirit to help me to bless you, to grant me clarity of thought and speech and not to be distracted. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Let's address this because this comes up by anti-Trinitarians across the board. Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, you name it. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, so you catch it here? There's one God and Jesus is distinguished from that one God. There's one God and the Lord Jesus Christ is distinguished from the one God. He's the one made here before the one God. Therefore, how can he be God, right? He can't be God if he's the mediator before the one God. Do you understand the objection? Do you understand what the objection is? So I can show you how to answer this objection when it arises. As we trust the Holy Spirit to fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ, may Jesus Christ increase in us. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Speaking of the little angel, just text, because it always needs attention. All right. Anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Number one. Number one. Sahi, you heard that miracle, huh? Shmiluk, what the miracle that God gave me that shows you how real God is. And whether we like it or not, Sahi, we're going to stand before Jesus Christ, give an answer for the way we live. May the Lord Jesus cleanse us and save us. We're in trouble, buddy. All right. But it's a true story, Sahi. So that's how real our God is. But. Coming to the issue. Number one, guys, number one, rule of thumb. When someone quotes a particular book, book, I want to teach you by the power of the Holy Spirit using me to teach you. Try to answer the objection from that book itself or from the author himself before you go to another book. In other words, if someone quotes 1 Timothy, don't run to the Gospel of John. Don't run to the Gospel of Mark. Stay with Paul. Stay with Timothy if you can to make your case. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? Right? What I want you to do is first prove your case from the particular writing or author that's being misquoted before you run to someone else. Because why? 
most of the groups that you're going to engage, apart from Joe's Witnesses and other Aryans who believe in all of Scripture, if you're dealing with Muslims or if you're dealing with atheists, agnostics, they don't believe the Bible is a consistent revelation. They don't believe that the books of the Bible are harmonious. They will assume that different writers believe different things and often contradictory things, right? That's not buffering here. My connection is good. It's probably buffering for you. Are you with me there? Everyone with me there? So what I like to do is I like to use the very author, right? Or the very book to prove my point and show that he's consistent and harmonious with the scriptures as a whole. So learn that because oftentimes what Christians do oftentimes is someone quotes John and they run to Philippians chapter two. Someone quotes Mark and they run to John. Now that works with Joe's witnesses who take the whole Bible as God's revelation that works with these Unitarian heretics who are not Christians who though they think they are who take the whole Bible as the inspired and errant word of God. It will not work with Bart Ehrman. It will not work with agnostics, atheists, and it will not work with Muslims, even though we shouldn't really care what works with them because they are not my authority and they don't determine truth or how to arrive at truth. But still with that said, I like to beat them at their own game, use their own source against them to refute them and shame them for the glory of Christ. Right? In other words, I don't want you to make Muslims your authority of how to prove your case. Muslims don't tell me how to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, how to present the deity of Christ, how to glorify Christ. However, with that said, still, still, I like to meet them on their own level and beat them at their own game and use their own argument against them. Okay. Okay. So with that said, that's the first rule. Secondly, notice 1 Timothy chapter 2 is not the first chapter. It's the second chapter, right? Are you with me there? 1 Timothy chapter 2, it's the second chapter in the book. Even though in the Greek manuscripts there were no chapter divisions. But thank the Lord for the invention of chapters and verses, right? Because it helps us to find verses much quickly. As opposed to having what they call an unsealed manuscript, a majuscule. The oldest Greek copies of the New Testament are written in majuscule or unseal, unsiles, where it's all capital letters, no division between the words, and no chapter divisions or verses. Makes it very hard to find something when you're reading that kind of text. So thank the Lord that you live at a time where you have chapters and verses in modern technology where a verse is one fingertip away Thank the Lord for all this blessing. And by the way, because of all this blessing, which makes us, which makes the Bible more accessible, easier to understand, easier to navigate, the more responsibility we will have before God. Did you know that? You with me there? The greater the blessings, the greater the responsibility, and the greater the judgment. We live in an age, unlike any other age, where because of the computer and internet, modern technology, we have volumes of archaeological, historical, textual <clears throat> data in front of us that makes the Bible much easier and simpler to understand. And yet the level of biblical illiteracy is alarming. Right? It's alarming. Now, with that said, though, let's start with 1 Timothy chapter 1 and see what we can learn. What well, we can learn about Paul's view of the Lord Jesus Christ from the very first chapter. Okay. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Let's start at verse, yeah, let's start 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Guys, pay attention, focus, and pray the Holy Spirit will help me to focus and speak truth for the glory of Christ. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Sorry about that. I apologize for that. Sorry about that. Yep, distraction after distraction. Over there. Sorry, but pause. I guess I'm going to pray that the Lord will enable me. Okay, now read with me. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. 
unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, okay, you guys with me? There is no lag on my end. There's a lag on your end. So don't make your problem my problem. Okay, let's begin at verse 1. You guys are ready? Okay, are you ready? Let's read verse 1. Notice it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by whose commandment? Of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Did you catch it? Paul is saying that I'm an apostle because of a commandment given to me. I was ordered, I was commanded to be an apostle. It wasn't my free will. It wasn't my choice to be an apostle. I was given an order, a commandment that I had no choice to obey. Otherwise, I would suffer discipline and punishment, right? You with me there? I need to unpack the meat by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to go slowly. But here's what's astonishing. Remember, Paul is a monotheistic Jew, and he says, this order, this commandment, which commanded that I've been apostle of Jesus Christ, and if I chose choose to reject this commandment, I would be disciplined and punished for disobedience. Came from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, that would have been an astonishing to a first century Jew to say that someone other than God in heaven made me what I am and command me to be what I am. Did you notice this command didn't just come from the Father in heaven, but Jesus Christ our Lord? Father and Son together jointly command people on earth. That's the first point I want you to see. Are you with me there? Go back and read the entire Old Testament, the entire Hebrew Bible. You will not find a single place where someone alongside of God commands people on earth to assume specific roles and perform specific functions. That is something that only God and God alone does from heaven. Jehovah alone in heaven commands things to take place on earth. Did you catch it? Before I move on. Is it clear? So here's a monotheistic Jew named Paul. Saturated in the Old Testament, steeped in Judaism, a, a premier student of Gamliel, one of the greatest rabbis according to rabbinic Judaism, the son of Hillel, another great outstanding rabbi. And he knows the Old Testament. And yet he says, this order, this command for me, the apostle of Jesus Christ, was issued, came from God the Father, our Savior, and our Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Both of them jointly in heaven ordered me to be what I am. That in itself shows that Paul believes that Jesus Christ is essentially one with the Father because you cannot have God Almighty and a creature jointly together in heaven issuing commands to people on earth. That does not happen according to the Old Testament. Is that clear? Before I move on to the next point. Okay, verse 2, let's look at verse 2. It gets even better. Pray for me and I'll be filled with wisdom to teach you for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace. Now notice the source of this favor that comes to us on earth. The source of this mercy that we experience on earth. The source of the peace that fills us while we're on earth. Is from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow. <whistles> Within the first two verses of the very first chapter, Paul has identified Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, one with the Father in essence, in glory, in power, and honor, and majesty. The first two verses of the epistle start off, by equating Jesus with God the Father in essence, in glory, in power, in ability, in honor. 
And you're going to skip that and go to chapter 2 to try to prove that Jesus isn't God, one with the Father? You're going to ignore chapter 1, how Paul begins the epistle by affirming and highlighting Jesus' essential unity with the Father, that Jesus with the Father in heaven does what only God does? Ignore all that and then run to 1 Timothy 2, 5, having Paul contradict himself? Really? You and me so far? Grace, mercy, and peace comes from who? According to Paul in chapter 1, verse 2. Grace, mercy, and peace comes from whom? God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's my challenge to all these anti-Trinitarian heretics and these Unitarian agents of Satan who think they are Christians. I challenge all of them to quote a single verse in the entire Hebrew Bible where God and a creature, God and a creature in heaven, a creature in heaven alongside of God bestows spiritual blessings such as mercy, grace, and peace upon the people of God on earth. Here's my challenge. All you anti-Trinitarian heretics, Quote a single verse in the Hebrew Bible where God and a creature in heaven together jointly bestow spiritual blessings upon people on earth. You won't find it, but this is what you're going to find in number six, verses 22 to 26. Number six, verses 22 to 26, specifically verses 24 to 26. Number six, verses 22 to 26. Guys, do you see how much meat there is in your Bible proving the Trinity that we are ignorant of? That by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, now we see to have no doubt that the God who exists is triune and Jesus is God in the flesh? Read with me the priestly blessing called the Aaronic Blessing. Number 6, 22 to 26. How does God command his people to be blessed by the priests? Here it is, number 6, 22 to 26. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, the high priest, and unto his son, saying, On this way, in this manner, ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Jehovah bless thee. Guys, pay attention. Here's the way priests are to pray blessings upon the people of God. Aaron, your sons, this is how you bless my people. Jehovah bless thee and keep thee. Pay attention to keep thee. Keep Remember that word, keep thee. Jehovah, make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Blessing and grace. Right? Jehovah, lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Wow. Blessing, grace, and peace from Jehovah to his people. Aaron, the high priest, and your sons, when you pray blessing on my people... You invoke Je Jehovah to grant them blessing, peace, and grace. Did you catch it or no? You guys catch it? When the high priest is to pray blessing on the people of God, who does the high priest invoke to pour out, bestow his mercies, his grace, his graciousness, and his peace. Who? Jehovah. Does he mention anyone besides Jehovah? Does he mention a creature alongside of Jehovah? Okay, so now explain to me 1 Timothy 1 verse 2 again. Explain that to me again. 1 Timothy 1 verse 2. And by the way, the entire New Testament epistles do this very thing. They invoke either God the Father and Jesus Christ together, or Father, Son, Holy Spirit together, or even Jesus alone in many places. Notice, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ the Lord. These very invocations and benedict benedictions are sufficient in of themselves, to prove the deity of Christ. Did you know that? If you wanted to prove that Jesus is God Almighty, equal to the Father, 
All you need to do is quote these invocations, these prayers, these benedictions. Did you know that? That's all you need to do. Because in light of the Hebrew Bible, people on earth only invoke, only ask, only request Jehovah to grant blessings, peace, grace, love, you name it, upon the people of God. Do you know that? Before I move on. So did you catch that the first two verses of chapter 1? The first two verses of chapter 1. Right? Already begin with an explicit affirmation that Jesus in heaven is equal to the Father in essence, in glory, in power, in majesty, and honor. Which is why Jesus does what only God can do and does everything the Father does for believers on earth. The first two verses, folks. And this is all throughout the New Testament epistles, by the way, right? Paul is not the only one. Let me show you John in his epistles invoking the Father and the Son together for spiritual blessings and graces. Okay? Let's go to 2 John chapter 1, verse 3. 2 John chapter 1, verse 3. Second John chapter 1, verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Wow. <whistles> yep, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 is a Trinitarian benediction, as is Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. Did you catch it? John says, the grace that we receive, this favor, favor for salvation, favor to live a holy life, Favor that results in us being empowered by the Spirit to obey Christ, to mortify our flesh and remain faithful, right? Mercy, right? That God shows us mercy and doesn't give us what we deserve. And the peace we enjoy with God and one another comes from the Father and the Father's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, equally. <whistles> Zina, oh, you of little faith, even though you're an Assyrian slash Chaldean, you, of all, shock me the most. Of course, it will work with anyone if the Holy Spirit takes your witness and convicts them and opens their heart to the truth. And of course, it won't work with any group if the Holy Spirit doesn't use your efforts and empower your witness to convict them to see the truth. Oh, you of little, little faith, Zina. I can't wait to see you. Me and Chu's are going to lay hands on you and bless you. Hey, old sister, wake up, wake up, sister. Can I get a witness? With me there? Did you see that in 2 John verse 3? 2 John 1 verse 3. Whom did John invoke to grant us this grace, this mercy and peace? God, our Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Hallelujah. John, Paul, Peter, all of them were Trinitarians who believe the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, not the same person, three divine persons who are equal in essence, in power, in glory, in majesty, and honor. You see why we're Trinitarians? You see why we're Trinitarians? Now let me show you where Jesus himself is invoked, where they invoke Jesus to grant these spiritual blessings. Jesus alone. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 to 23. I hope not putting you to sleep in truth and love. Hallelujah. The truth of God's word and the love that God fills us for him and for one another. First Corinthians 16, 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, eternally condemned. Maran afe. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Whoa. Wait, 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 wait. Paul, you are a Jew of all Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know the Old Testament. How dare you end your letter by invoking Jesus, who's not on earth, but in heaven, to grant all Christians grace? How dare you do that, Paul? Don't you know that such prayers for such blessings are to be offered to God alone, Paul? Yeah, I know that. Then why would you pray to Jesus to grant us grace from heaven? 
because Jesus is God. Hello. Oh, I see, Paul. But wait, Jesus isn't the Father. Yeah, he's not. But the Father is God. Yes. So wait, Paul, you're telling me Jesus and the Father are God? Yes. But wait, there's only one God, Paul. Amen. And Jesus is not the same person as the Father. Amen. So they're not two gods. No. But they're not the same person. No. Oh, I see why the church was forced to come up with the doctrine of the Trinity. Hmm. Thank you, Paul. But you didn't catch 1 Corinthians 16, 22. You did not catch 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Huh? And Jeremiah. That's why those Unitarians are going to go to hell. I don't care what they say, Jeremiah. If the New Testament is consistent with the Old Testament, then such prayers cannot be offered to an exalted man without this making God into an idolater who then leads people into idolatry because he's enabling a man in heaven, a creature, to do what is uniquely a divine function, pour out all spiritual blessings upon all believers on earth, which requires omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. So unless they want to admit that this man is now deified and therefore they are idolaters and God is in the business of making idolatry, I don't care what they got to say, Jeremiah. You with me there, brother? But let's go back to 1 Corinthians 16, 22. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Watch it again. Let's read. If any man not, love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema modern author. This is why I love the King James Bible. And I pray by the grace of Jesus Christ, I stick to it and relearn it and memorize the Bible from this version. Do you know why I love the King James? Because it gave you the word in Greek, which comes from Aramaic. Let me break this down. The Greek has modern author, but it's not a Greek word. The Greek, if you read the Greek New Testament, it says modern author, but it's not a Greek word. This is what we call a transliterated word, transliteration. Translation is where you take a word in one language and translate its meaning in another language. But transliteration means you basically keep that same word in a target language. In other words, I don't translate one word in one language with its meaning in another language. So if I were to translate modern athe, it would be our Lord come. That's what the Aramaic means. Our Lord come. But that's not what Paul did. Paul didn't translate the Aramaic into Greek. He kept the Arama Aramaic word. Is there with me or am I confusing you? If you're confused, let me know. The difference between a transliteration and a translation. Transliteration is where you take one word in one language and adopt it in another language. This is an Aramaic word, but now it's adopted into Greek. It now becomes a word in Greek. Though it's Aramaic, it's now transferred over into Greek, and it's now part of the Greek language. I'll give you an example in English. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is not an English word. It's a Hebrew word that's been adopted into the English language and it's now transliterated. Transliterate. Hallelujah. If I were to translate hallelujah into English, it's praise Yah. Praise Jehovah. Hallel is praise in Hebrew. Jah is the abbreviated form of the divine name. But we don't translate it, right? I mean, we do say praise the Lord, but we say hallelujah. Hallelujah is not English. It's Hebrew that has been now adopted into the English language. Right? As the Holy Spirit grants me clarity of thought to speak truth without error for the glory of Christ. Right? You understand what it is? So in the Greek, this is what you would read. Maron Athe. Maron Athe. That's in the Greek itself. So Paul didn't translate the Aramaic with the Greek equivalent. He simply adopted the Aramaic into the Greek language. Now, here's what's interesting. 
Paul doesn't have to explain what modern Atha means to these Greek-speaking Christians at Corinth. Here it is. He gave you the Greek. Etis o phile ton kurian yesun kristan. I'm giving the Erasmian pronunciation. Forgive me. Yesun kristan. Ito anathema modern Atha. Etis o phile ton kurian yesun kriston. Etu anathema modern Atha. Do you see? He just gave you the Greek of 1 Corinthians 16, 22. The last two words, maran athe. Okay, this is Aramaic. Now, here's what's mind blowing. Here's what's mind blowing Paul is writing to Greek speaking Christians and he uses an Aramaic word and he doesn't translate it. You know why? You know why he doesn't translate it? Because he knows that his audience already know what the word means. They already know what the word means, so he doesn't have to explain. He doesn't have to explain. Okay, but for those of you who don't read Aramaic, and you're reading the King James, the King James says, modern author, post the King James again. Okay. The King James retains the Aramaic in English. Here's the King James. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, modern author. What does Maran Atha mean? Well, here, let's break it down. Maran means the Lord or our Lord. Okay. Atha means come. I have Aramaic speaking Christians in the audience, Assyrians and Chaldeans. We still use that word today. Maran Atha means our Lord comes. In fact, in my dialect of Aramaic, I speak Jilu, I say Maran. Well, I no, I wouldn't say that. Because I'd say Maran Pe. There are Assyrians who would say Maran Ate. Maran Ate. You have Assyrians today that use that expression and will say Maran Ate. See, my friends, Toma. If he wants to say our Lord comes or will come, he'll say Maran Ate. Okay. Now, you know what this means? Can I tell you what this means? See, you got a Syrian Chaldean saying, yep. You know what this means? The fact that Paul doesn't translate the phrase means that the Greek-speaking Christians already knew what it meant. And it's a prayer. It's a prayer. See? Sai Christian, Sai Christian speaks a dialect of Aramaic, Syriac, that says it exactly the way Paul wrote it. Maran Athe. They say it exactly the same way till this day. Okay, Sai Christian, he's a witness. Okay, now you know what this tells you? That this prayer, because it's a prayer, our Lord come, our Lord come. So the Christians are praying and they're saying, our Lord come, come, O Lord. They're asking Jesus to return. It's a prayer to Jesus to return. Are you with me there? Do you under, see, I'm taking time to unpack this. A lot of meat. Okay. Do you understand? It's a prayer by Christians on earth to Jesus saying, Lord, come. Our Lord, come. Return. Come. We're waiting for you. It's a prayer. So number one, they're praying to Jesus. But number two, the very fact it's Aramaic tells you this prayer to Jesus didn't start among the Greeks. It started among the Jews who spoke Aramaic. In other words, 1 Corinthians 16, 22 proves that the Jews were already worshiping Jesus in Jerusalem. And in their mother tongue, Aramaic, they're already praying to Jesus, asking Jesus to come. The Jews in Jerusalem were praying this prayer, which is why it's in Aramaic. Yep, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Let me now show you the phrase modern atha used by John in Greek as a prayer to Jesus to return. Revelation 22, verse 20 and 21. Revelation 22, verse 20 and 21. Here, here you go. John invokes Jesus in the same words, but in Greek. This was Aramaic. John does it in Greek. Here you go. Revelation 22, 20 to 21. He which testifieth 
these things saith. Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And like Paul, notice how he ends it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. John ends Revelation the same way Paul ends 1 Corinthians. Come, Lord Jesus. That's what modern author means. Our Lord come. What Lord's coming? Jesus. Paul and John invoke Jesus to return to come. Paul does it in Aramaic. John does it in Greek. And both of them end it the same way. Notice 1 Corinthians 16, 23 and Revelation 22, 21. 1 Corinthians 16, 23 and Revelation 22, 21. Watch here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's Paul. Notice John. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. John, what's going on? Why is it that you and Paul sound the same and worship the same way and both of you worship Jesus, invoke Jesus, ask Jesus our Lord to return and ask Jesus to pour out his grace? John, why is it you sound like Paul and the way you pray to Jesus, worship Jesus and invoke Jesus? Why is that, John? Why is that, Paul? Do you see what's happening? Do you see what's happening here? Are you catching the pattern here? Paul and the other New Testament writers in their epistles invoke the Father and the Son. Pray to the Father and the Son to grant spiritual blessings jointly together upon believers on earth. And in few instances, they even invoke Jesus alone. In light of the Hebrew Bible, in light of the Old Testament, to invoke a creature in heaven to bestow spiritual blessings to believers on earth would be idolatry, would be blasphemy. Are you with me there? So how could Paul, a monotheistic Jew, John, a monotheistic Jew, invoke the Father and Jesus Christ, or in certain places invoke Jesus alone, who's in heaven, to bestow graces, blessings on believers on earth if Jesus is a creature? Because he's no creature, Paul and John and the Jews in Jerusalem all knew, believed, and realized Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh, equal to the Father in essence, in glory, in power, in honor, in majesty, though not the same person. Let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. There's more meat. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12. To 16. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Let's read. Yep, bye bye, JW. Exactly, Aldarius. And I thank, notice who Paul thanks. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, I don't know if you're reading this. I thank Jesus Christ our Lord. But Paul, how do you thank Jesus? He's not on earth. How do you thank him? He's not on earth, he's in heaven. I pray to him, and that's how I thank him. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice why he thanks him, who hath enabled me, who has strengthened me, who has empowered me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Wait, Paul. You're thanking Jesus in heaven for empowering you to do ministry and to live the Christian life? You're thanking Jesus in heaven for counting you worthy to do ministry? Because he put you in ministry and he's giving you the power to do ministry. Jesus in heaven, hmm. who was before, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. I didn't know any better. I didn't know who Jesus was. So God showed me mercy. Now watch. And the grace of our Lord. Wait, wait, wait. The grace of our Lord Jesus, the one you thank in heaven for empowering you on earth to do ministry for his glory. From whom you obtain mercy, right? Read with me. 
right? Watch what's happening here. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This grace comes from believing in Jesus. This faith comes from Jesus. It's only in Jesus, believing in him, that you receive such favor and faith. Let's read 15 and 16. 15 and 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for the cause I obtain mercy. That in me, first, Jesus Christ might show that through me, as an example, Jesus used me as an example to others. Pay attention. Jesus used me as an example to others, right? Show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Did you guys catch this amazing section of First Timothy? Paul says, Jesus Christ showed me mercy on earth. Granted me grace on earth instead of destroying me, a blasphemer who persecuted Christians, who killed Christians because I didn't know any better. But instead of destroying me, Jesus showed me mercy from heaven, grace from heaven, and forgave me and was patient with me as an example to others that if Jesus could do this for me, a blasphemer, then don't lose hope. He'll do it for you. If a blasphemer who is persecuting Christians, getting them killed, can be forgiven by Jesus, then th that means there's hope for you. He'll forgive you too. Don't lose hope. You understand what he's saying here? But wait. Why is Paul thanking Jesus in heaven? Why is Paul saying Jesus in heaven gave me this grace? this mercy and was patient with me and gave me the power and strength to remain faithful in ministry to glorify him. Paul, how dare you thank Jesus in heaven, attribute this salvation, this grace and mercy that transformed you from a blasphemer into a saint and the power that you need to remain faithful and do ministry to Jesus in heaven if Jesus isn't God, Paul. How could you attribute this to Jesus? Paul, what are you doing, man? You are a Jew. You know the Old Testament. You know it's only God that gives you strength from heaven. It's only God that is patient with people on earth. It is only God that gives grace and mercy leading to salvation. How are you ascribing all this to Jesus, Paul? What are you doing, Paul? Do you see how much meat are in these verses that we overlook meat to show that Jesus is God Almighty, he is glorious, and the hope and the encouragement and comfort this meat gives us to know that we're not beyond the grace and mercy and love and patience of Jesus. Paul is saying, if I... A blasphemer who was killing Christians and persecuting them could be forgiven by that same Jesus, could be loved by that same Jesus, could be transformed by that same Jesus. And that same Jesus give me the power I need to love him, to remain faithful and do ministry, to glorify him. If I, Paul, could be given that grace, then don't you ever doubt that Jesus will forgive and love you too. Man, I did the unimaginable. I killed Christians. I imprisoned them, persecuted them, and Jesus still forgave me. What's your excuse for not going to Jesus and trusting Jesus will forgive you? What sin could you have committed that would be greater than the grace and mercy and love of Jesus? You see his point? Okay, but let's go back to 1 Timothy 1.12 one more time. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12 one more time, because I want you to see this. And I thank who? Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank who? Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, empowered me, strengthened me, for that he in heaven counted me on earth faithful, putting me into the ministry. Jesus put me in ministry. 
Jesus gives me the power to remain in ministry, to be holy and faithful and to love him till I die. Who gave me that power? Jesus did. Who put me in ministry? Jesus did. Who do I thank? I thank Jesus. Isn't it amazing that like me and Zena are talking about a movie and a trailer, which insults me because I'm talking about Jesus and his goodness? And of all people, Zena's the one now doing it. Isn't it amazing that Zena wants to justify it by saying it's a movie about Paul? Who cares about a movie about Paul? We're reading Paul's letter. Which is better, watch a movie about him or read his letter inspired by the Spirit? Choose. Please do me a favor. Make a choice. Lay hands on her right now on her forehead and bless her. Right? I'd rather see a movie about Paul by an actor than read Paul's letters inspired by the Holy Spirit, line upon line, chapter by chapter, verse. Yes, that's more that's more edifying. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Okay. Now, do you want proof that Jesus is being worshipped as God? By the way, that's my Jim Carrey impersonation from Living Color, where he plays that freaky looking girl in Living Color. <laughs> oh, you behave. All right. All right. Okay, now. With that said, <laughs> I need a six pack. I got a kick. With that said, do you want proof that Paul is worshiping Jesus as God, praying to Jesus as God? Do you want more proof? Let's look at 1 Timothy 1.12 and 2 Timothy 1.3 back to back. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 and 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 back to back. Guys, read with me. The Greek is the same. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. But wait, 2 Timothy 1.3, I thank God whom I serve. From my forefathers. Wait, 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 Paul. Who do you thank? In 2 Timothy 1 3, you're thanking God the Father. 1 Timothy 1 12, you're thanking Jesus Christ. Paul, who do you thank, man? Wait. But the God that your forefathers worship is Jehovah God, and your forefathers only thank Jehovah God, only pray to Jehovah God, only invoke Jehovah God in heaven. But here, Paul, in 2 Timothy 1 3, you're thanking God. But in 1 Timothy 1.12, you're thanking Jesus. What's going on here? What's going on here? Could it be any clearer from the pastoral epistles, the epistles that Paul wrote to Timothy, that he is worshiping Jesus as God, praying to Jesus as God, invoking Jesus as God, <clears throat> thanking Jesus as he thanks God? Could it be any clearer? They'll twist everything under the sun unless the Holy Spirit convicts the Jehovah's Witness to see the truth. Guys, is it astonishing? The very first chapter, all this meat in the very first chapter where Paul identifies Jesus as God, one with the Father. He's not the same as the Father. By ascribing to Jesus the unique divine characteristics and abilities that the Hebrew Bible ascribed to Jehovah God alone. Is it clear? Before I move on, I just want to make sure everyone's getting it. So now when we go to 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. Yeah, in their Bible, Aldorius, 1 Timothy starts in chapter 2. That is on a start in verse 1, on chapter 1. And their Bible, 1 Timothy, starts in chapter 2, not in chapter 1. Okay, now, watch here. Watch here. 1 Timothy 2, 5. Okay. So now when we read 1 Timothy 2, 5, after what Paul has already said about the Lord Jesus Christ, do you think anyone reading 1 Timothy 2 in context, starting at verse 1 of chapter 1, would assume that Paul now is contradicting himself and denying that Jesus is God? 
simply because he distinguished Jesus as the one mediator from the one God before whom he mediates? You think that's what Paul wanted you to see? Do you think that's what Paul wanted you to conclude after reading chapter 1 before arriving at chapter 2? But I'm going to use chapter 2 itself to prove Jesus has to be God. Are you ready for the proof? I'm going to use chapter 2 itself to prove Jesus must be God. Are you ready? Are you ready for it? Let's look at 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 to 6. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 to 6. Let's look at it again. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself, pay attention, a ransom for all. Verse 6 shows Jesus has to be God in the flesh. If the New Testament is consistent with the Hebrew Bible. If the New Testament is consistent with the Hebrew Bible, Jesus has to be God in the flesh. Why? Because notice 6, Jesus gave himself as a ransom to redeem everyone, right? Okay. Let's go to Psalm 49, verses 7 to 9. Psalm 49, verses 7 to 9. None of them, none of them, no human creature fallible human creature can by any means redeem his brother read this folks none of them but can by any means redeem his brother nor give to god a ransom for him no human creature can offer god a ransom to save his fellow brother for the redemption of their soul is precious and it seizeth forever in other words it's too high and you can't prevent a human soul from dying that he should still live forever and not see corruption. Now, I'm really confused. Psalm 49 says, a human being, a human being is incapable of offering God a ransom to save a single human soul so that it continues forever. Can't do it. Now, verse 15, verse 15. Same Psalm, verse 15. Same Psalm, verse 15. Psalm 49, verse 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. So now, guys, help me understand this. Psalm 49 says, a human creature, fallible, fallen human creature, is incapable of redeeming a single human life, let alone all human souls, which is why God has to redeem us. But Paul just said, Jesus Christ, the man, who's our mediator, the man, offered himself to ransom all human lives. How, Paul? Don't you know your Old Testament? Yes. You know your Old Testament says human beings can't do that? Yes. Then how can Jesus do what no human being is able to do? A human being can't even redeem one human life. He can't even redeem himself. You're saying Jesus redeems, redeems all human lives. How? I thought he's a man. Because I already told you in chapter 1, he's more than a man. He is God who became man. He's the God man. Oh, I see. Isaiah 59, verse 16. Isaiah 59, verse 16. Isaiah 59, verse 16. God saw, pay attention here. God saw, Jehovah saw, that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, no mediator, good enough. Therefore, his arm... Jehovah's own arm, a metaphor for his power, brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. Wait, Isaiah says, when God looked for a human being to save, to intercede, he couldn't find anyone worthy enough. So he had to act in his own power, in his own arm to do it. Isaiah 63, verse 5. Isaiah 63, verse 5. And I looked, this is Jehovah speaking. Guys, pay attention, Jehovah speaking. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. Wait, 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 wait. Paul, you know Psalms, right? Yeah. You know Isaiah? Sure, I quote from all the time. Paul, did you not read that Jehovah said, 
When he looked for a man worthy enough to intercede or save, he couldn't find no man, which is why God chose to do it in his own arm, in his own strength, in his own power. Yeah. Then how can you say Jesus the man was able to ransom all human souls when only God can do that? Because Jesus isn't merely a man. I thought I made that clear in chapter one. Haven't you read? Jesus is God in the flesh. You with me there? Okay. Notice it says his own arm. He says, my own arm in Isaiah 63, 5. And Isaiah 59, 16, because it's Isaiah speaking of Jehovah, his own arm. Now, God is a spirit being. And as a spirit being, he doesn't have a physical arm. So his own arm, my own arm means his strength, his power. It's a metaphor for his strength, his power. Because what do you use your arms with? To lift, to push, to resist, to strike, right? So arm becomes a metaphor for power, for strength, right? Right? Yeah, you can use it to hug. But in this context, you use your, your arm to lift something, to resist something, to strike something, right? It's a metaphor for power. To uphold something, right? To carry something. Okay, right? So arm of Jehovah is simply another way of saying the power of Jehovah, the strength of Jehovah. Okay, now with that said, 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 24. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 24. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's why Jesus does what only God can do, because he's the very power of God, the arm of God the Father in the flesh. You caught it? Jesus is the arm of Jehovah. The power of Jehovah that became flesh. Are you guys catching it or no? In fact, Isaiah 53 says that the servant of Jehovah who bears our sins, the servant of Jehovah who's numbered with the transgressors, who offers his soul as a guilt offering, Asham, He's actually the arm of Jehovah. Let me prove it to you. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 2. Prophecy says, the servant of Jehovah who dies to atone for the sins of the world, who offers his soul as an asham, a guilt offering, who makes intercession for transgressors, he is the arm of Jehovah. Here, read with me. Let's see if you catch it. Let's read. Who hath believed our report? And to whom, pay attention, to whom is the arm of the Lord Jehovah revealed? Who has seen the arm of Jehovah? Now, who's the arm of Jehovah? Read verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Who is he? Who is this one that grows up before Jehovah as a plant springs up? And as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. No, it doesn't say Jesus. I know the New Testament tells us it's Jesus. But it doesn't say Jesus here. You're not paying attention. Post Isaiah 53 verses 1 and 2 one more time. It doesn't say Jesus. It doesn't say Messiah. Don't add to the text. In Isaiah 53, 1 and 2, who is it? Read it. It doesn't even say servant. You're not reading. Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him. Who is the he that grows up before Jehovah? Under Jehovah's eye. Angela, it does not say Jesus Christ. Let's try it again. Read it. It's there. King of kings, if you show me son, I'll go to the mosque and take shahada. Why aren't you guys listening? It's there. The words are there.
Isaiah 53, 1 and 2, one more time. Who is this one growing up before Jehovah who had no beauty to attract us to him? Nada, you're tempting me to block you, but you're such a good sister, I won't. Can you show me the words Holy Spirit in verses 1 or 2? I'll become Orthodox. I'll get baptized in your church. Show me the words Holy Spirit. Why are you guys adding to the text? It's right there, verses 1 or 2. 1 or 2, come on, folks. Come on. It's right there. Verses 1 or 2, it's there. Read it one more time. I'm not going there until you get it. No. He grows up like a tender plant, but you're told who he is in verses 1 and 2. Yes, Tony. Revelation, first and last. Most of you got it. Life is good. The one who grows up before him, who has no beauty to draw us to him, the arm of the Lord, it's right there. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, the arm of the Lord, grew up before him like a tender plant. It's there, folks. Read it. So, Nabi Dawood, if you show me crucified Christ in the passage, I'll come and smack you in the mouth. You guys can't read context? I mean, shame on you guys, seriously. You guys can't read what is in front of you? Is that how illiterate we've become? Seriously? Can't you read before your eyes? Don't add to the text. If it says Messiah, I'll give you a million bucks. Says Jesus Christ, a million bucks. Read the words. It's there. Isaiah 53, verses 1 or 2. Let's read it again. Who cares who the hour is, Abby? Don't make me block you and introduce something else. Read who the tender plant is that grows up before Jehovah. No, Kings, this is the fifth time I said in the text. Who is the one that grows up before Jehovah as a tender plant? Who has no beauty that we should be brought to him? We wasted 10 minutes on this, folks. Come on now. Wake up, church. Who? Jeremy's going to kill me. Jeremy, dude, I think you're tired. I need to block you. Jeremy, for the love of God, the plant grows up before the Lord. Verses 1 and 2. Who is it? Let's see if you caught it. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He. He goes back to the nearest antecedent. Soldier of Christ. Man, you guys are tempting me to block some of you guys. Seriously. Yeah, soldier, I think I'm going to make an example of you. Should I make an example of you? Okay, Gia. If you don't get the answer, Gia, and the next time around, I'm going to block you. Who is the plant that grows up before Jehovah? It's there in verses 1 or 2. The level of biblical illiteracy is killing me. Andrew Martin, who's an atheist, got it. And then people get upset. Why are you wasting time? My first victim. Okay. Okay. Who's getting it? I'm gonna start taking casualties. Who's who's getting it? Why is it so hard for us to understand the Bible? Why is it so hard for us to uh, to understand the Bible? I mean, the level of biblical literacy, honestly. You don't need to be a genius to see it. One more time in Isaiah 53, verses 1 or 2. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender plant. Who is the one that grows up, sprouts out like a plant before Jehovah, who has no beauty to draw us to him? Uh, who caught it now? We wasted too much time on this. Come on, last time. I need answers. Come on, guys. Speed it up. 
Okay. Okay. Keep going. Answer, guys. Come on. I want all of you to answer. Beautiful. 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 You got it finally. The servant of Jehovah in Isaiah 53, he is the arm of Jehovah. You guys got it. Soldier Christ, it's not just about you. I got to make sure everyone's getting it. You guys finally got it. Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 2 is telling you the plant that grows be up before Jehovah, the one who has no beauty to draw us to him, the servant who offers his life as a guilt offering, who is numbered with transgressors and makes intercession for them. He is the arm of Jehovah. That's his name. Do you got it now? Did you get it now? Did you understand? One of the names of the servant of Jehovah, whom the New Testament says is the Messiah, Jesus. One of his names is that he is the arm of Jehovah. Unbelievable. Why would it be hard for you guys to get this? I'm not trying to belittle you. You guys are intelligent. You're smart. You're spirit-filled. You have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to be Einstein to see this, man. It's there. Read context. Read. Right? Okay. Now, let me show you something. Let me show you something. People say, Sam, you're too harsh. No, it's not I'm trying to be harsh. I love you guys. Honestly, I do. I love you guys. That's why I want to teach. I want this wisdom to be yours. It's from the Holy Spirit for all of us. I mean it. I want you to be the best Christians on fire for Jesus and love with Jesus. Okay, now, let me show you something. Okay, let me show you something. Okay, pay attention now. Isaiah 59, 16. Now, guys, here's where I need you to listen. Here what we're going to do back to back. Isaiah 59, 16 with 63, verse 5. And pay attention, 53, verse 12. Okay? Back to back. Pay attention. Watch here. Well, Abby, it is poetic in that the servant is not literally his arm, right? Jesus wasn't an arm, a long arm with fingers walking around. But it's poetic in the sense that it's a metaphor telling us something about this person and his nature and relationship to Jehovah. Okay, now read with me. Guys, read with me. Isaiah 59, 16. Isaiah 63, 5 and 53, 12. Read with me. No question. Stop texting. Read. And he saw that there was no man. Pay attention. Jehovah saw there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, no one worthy enough to be an intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So there was no man who was good enough to intercede. So Jehovah's own arm became the intercessor. Okay. 63, 5 says the same thing. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered, there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. Now, guys, read 53.12. 53.12. Remember, Jehovah said, there was no man worthy to intercede to save. So my arm became the intercessor. My arm brought salvation. But wait. The servant, Isaiah 53.12. Pay attention. The servant, Isaiah 53.12. Therefore, Jehovah speaking. I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Wait, Jehovah, wait. How can he, the servant, make intercession for sinners and bear their sin? When you just told us, Jehovah, no man was worthy enough to intercede, worthy enough to save, so your own arm did the intercession.
Did you catch it or no? Isaiah 53, 12 says that the servant who was pierced for our sins, who offered his life as a, a sham, a guilt offering for our sins, who was numbered with transgressors and bore their sins, that servant made intercession. But wait, Jehovah, you just said in Isaiah 59, Isaiah 6, 3, no man was good enough to be an intercessor for you. So your own arm did it. Is there a contradiction? No. Because Isaiah 53 verse 1 told you the servant is Jehovah's arm. You get it? There is no contradiction. The servant, it's okay, Michael B. got it, Zena. Thank you, sister. The servant can intercede, can save, can justify, can bear the sins of the world. Because the servant is no mere man. Isaiah 53, 1 told you the servant is the arm of Jehovah. He's one with him. You got it? Did you see where I'm going with this? That's why Paul can say, Jesus, the man... Is the one mediator before the one God the Father and offered his life as a ransom for many, though the Bible says, the Hebrew Bible, no man can ransom a single life. No man is good enough to intercede. No man is good enough to justify. No man can save anyone. But Jesus is good enough because he's not just a man. He's more than a man. He is the infinite eternal power of the Father, the arm of the Father, God in the flesh. That's the point. Do you catch it now? Are you catching where I went with this? If you take, if you take Isaiah 59, 16, Isaiah 63, verse 5, where no man was good enough to save or justify or bring judgment and intercede. No one. Jehovah had to do it in his own arm, in his own strength, in his own power, by his own arm. My arm, he says. And then you look at the servant who offers his life, his soul, as a ransom to save many, as a guilt offering, to atone for sins, to justify, to intercede. The reason why there's no contradiction is because Isaiah already told you that servant is the very arm of Jehovah who grew up before our eyes and had no beauty to attract us to him. You with me there? Exactly, Andrew. That's why I'm saying Andrew, in Jesus' name, will fall in love with the triumph God, will worship Jesus as God once again, sooner than later, because he knows too much truth and he sees it. Look, the guy sees it. Look what he just told Gia. Look, look, the wisdom. Watch here. Look what he said, said to her. God's arm reaching to us. Jesus who intercedes for all. He sees it. You catch it? Isn't it ironic that 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6 in context shows that Jesus has to be more than a man, has to be one with the one God in order for him to do what he does. Isn't it ironic? The very passage these anti-Trinitarians quote to prove that Jesus is just a man distinct from the one God actually proves the opposite. If you read the next verse and read the first chapter, it shows though that though he's a man, he's more than a man. He is one in essence with the one God. Isn't that clear? What I hope you're learning from all this, folks, is what I'm hoping you're learning. Okay? Here's what I'm hoping you're learning. Learn context. Learn to read more than that one verse. Learn to read the verses before and after, the chapters before and after. after. Learn what the context of that writer's theology is. But what happens is you get discombobulated. He quotes one verse. Oh, you panic. Wait, 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 wait. Say, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. I got to read the verses before and after, guy. 
Let me see what it says before. Let me see what it says after. And since chapter two, let me start at chapter one. Read my way to chapter to see what he says. I can't just take one snippet out of one chapter in a context of a book that's six chapters long. Why is it so hard to do that, folks? Why is it hard? You understand the level of biblical illiteracy in the church today? It's sickening. It's saddening. It's heartbreaking. Right? You're right? So there you got it. There you answer. Now, this one now will take into consideration the particular Bible version that your opponent is using. Now here, we're going to have to be familiar with translations. Are you with me there? Gia, are you accusing me of getting nasty? I want you to say yes because I'm going to I'm going to you see what I'm going to do to you. Are you accusing me of being nasty, Gia? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I just want to see. One second, let me see. Another troublemaker with a nasty attitude. Are you accusing me of getting nasty, Gia? Quickly, because I'm going to bounce you if you don't answer. And answer honestly and don't be a coward. Sorry, folks. Hey, don't, brother. Good to see you, Just Me, Andrew. You got 10 seconds to answer, Gia. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Like a coward, you take a shot in your nasty attitude and accuse me of being nasty and you don't answer. Bye, bye. Uh, bye, 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 bye. Okay. Don't ever come back here. This is not for you. Snowflake. Sound like James White. My hero. Okay. Okay, guys. If you can't handle the heat, stay out of the kitchen. Sorry, folks. Let me repeat it again. I'm not for everyone. This channel is not for everyone. Find you a teacher that is suitable for you and let God work through that teacher to help you attain a level of spiritual maturity. But with that said, folks, now this part of the refutation, this part of the refutation is going to entail that you know what translation your opponent is reading, okay? You have to take the translation into consideration. Now, for the record, for the record, I am convinced, this is my personal belief, don't stone me, that the King James Bible is the perfect translation that God wants for English-speaking Christians. That doesn't mean I have all the answers, all the answers. That's my conviction, and I love it. That's me. That's my belief. That's me. That's my belief, okay? Someone wants to come in. So I'm sticking with it. After years of just meditating on this issue, I've come to that conclusion. And I love the King James Bible. And by faith, I believe it's the perfect word of God in English. That's my belief. I know it's not scholarly and my colleagues will laugh at me. That's okay. They can laugh at me. I don't care. It's okay. But I will use any translation. I will use any translation that my opponent uses to prove my point and to turn it against them. Therefore, if I'm dealing with a heretic who wants to use a modern version other than the King James or translations that follow the same translation principle or family of manuscripts, King James, New King James, modern English version are pretty much based on the same family of manuscripts. The New King James looks at what's known as the Byzantine text, the majority text, which are the majority of our Greek manuscripts. Over 5,000 of the Greek manuscripts form a family of texts known as the majority text or the Byzantine text, and they have a higher degree of agreement, of uniformity. From that family comes what is known as the received text, the Textus Receptus, which is where we get the King James from, right? So basically, the King James, modern English version, and the King James are basically from the same family of manuscripts, right? Modern English version even claims to be the modernized King James version. Okay. They're going to read the same way in this passage. However, 
when you're dealing with anti-Trinitarian groups like these Unitarian heretics who are not Christians or Joe's Witnesses, their translations or the translations they prefer are based on the older witnesses, the older papyri, which started appearing in the 19th century, 1800s and 20th century, which are earlier, they start popping up in the 3rd century, the 4th century, and also prioritize what is known as Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus, right? <clears throat> so they prefer these witnesses. Now, the reason why I mention that is, okay, the reason why I mention that is, whatever translation my opponent uses, I'll meet him at his level, and I'll use his translation against them. You see what I'm, what I'm trying to teach you? Even though you may believe the King James Bible is the perfect translation of God's words in English. What you need to learn to do is meet them at their own level and use their own translation against them. Are you with me? Because then you're going to get into a debate on which version is best and what family of manuscripts are superior. And you're going to waste a lot of time when you can simply meet them at their level and use their own translation against them. Everyone understand what I'm trying to get at? Everyone understand what I'm trying to get at? So King James 11, 1611. I want to encourage him to learn to use other translations to his advantage to convince them of the truth of the Godhead, the truth of the Trinity, the deity of Christ as humanity, and the truth of the gospel of salvation of free and pure grace, a grace you receive by faith in Christ alone. Okay, Teach you how to use other translations to your advan advantage. I even use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Trinity, the deity of Christ. Even that corrupt translation have has enough truth to bring them to the truth of the, of the Godhead. Now, if my opponent uses the King James or the New King James, or their modern English version, that I'm going to quote 1 Timothy 3.16. Benny Aldariosh is not Iranian. He's Assyrian, right? The people of Nineveh like me, okay? If they use King James, New King James, modern English version, then use 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. Okay? Why? Because... And these translations, based on the majority text, the Byzantine text, they have this reading. What's the reading? This is the reading of the majority of our Greek witnesses. What's the reading? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up, to, up into glory. Case closed, right? So the chapter after 1 Timothy 2 explicitly identifies Jesus as God, Theos, who appeared in the flesh. End of story. That's if you go with the King James, the New King James, and modern English version. If you go with modern versions based on earlier Greek witnesses, it doesn't say God was manifest in the flesh. So first and last, can you quote the NIV or any other modern version? 1 Timothy 3.16. Now, I can't show you why there's a difference because I would need visual aids to do so. Okay. That's fine. And Dr. Brown will be praying for me because he knows I'm going to do to James White what no one has done because I will, by the grace of Jesus, decimate him in lim limited atonement. What I will do to him, by the grace of God, is what I've never done to any other debate opponent, what's never happened to him in his debate career. Watch. That is my promise by the power of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, 1 Timothy 3.16, ESV. That's my promise to you guys. 1 Timothy 3.16. Notice the difference in the reading. Let's focus. This guy just distracted us because of Michael Brown. Thank you for the distraction. 1 Timothy 3.16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. Now, do me a favor, first and last. See what you did, brother? You brought up my future debate, hopefully by the grace of God, 
will get it organized with James White to be a distraction and nuisance, an agent of the devil. See what you did? Okay. First Timothy 3.16, post the King James ESV back to back. Anyone who asks me about the debate is going to get blocked, so ask me. First Timothy 3.16, back to back. King James and ESV. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. King James. ESV. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. You see why I won't use 1 Timothy 3.16 if my opponent prefers modern versions? If my opponent prefers modern versions, I don't go to 1 Timothy 3.16. Because in the modern versions, based on earlier Greek witnesses, it doesn't say theos, it says has. He was manifested in the flesh. Everyone see that? The difference? Okay. So if he's using a modern version, I don't go to 1 Timothy 3.16. I won't use it. But I will go to Titus 2.13, and I'm going to end it with Titus 2.13, because Titus 2.13, in the modern versions, read essentially the same way. Titus 2.13. Now, it doesn't read this way in the King James, so it gets tricky. So if he's going with a modern version, then I'm going to go to Titus 2.13 in the modern version. If you use ESV, quote ESV again for me, for the benefit of the people here. Protestant. We're going to stick with the modern version for Titus 2.13. Is that ESV, English Standard Version you just cited, the second one? Is that what you quoted? Okay. English Standard Version, Titus 2.13. Pay attention. You got to be alert, awake, not sleepy, because I'm going to go into a little meat. Waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. End of story. The only great God and Savior any monotheistic Jew could ever have is Jehovah God. The only great God and Savior any monotheistic Christian who's faithful to the Hebrew Bible could ever worship and have is Jehovah God. For Paul to identify Jesus Christ as our great God and Savior, Jesus must be Jehovah God in the flesh. You see it? You clear? Now, let me get into a little of the Greek. Okay. I'm going to give you the link to the Greek. And I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. Simple as possible. Okay. But, guys, this is where you're going to have to cool back on the texting if you're going to learn and follow. Okay, click on that. That's the Greek. Cut back on the texting so I can work this for you and help you understand. Okay. What you have here is something called the Granville Sharp's first rule. Granville Sharp was a Christian philanthropist and an abolitionist. He was against slavery and tried to abolish it. He wrote a monograph. Granville Sharp wrote a monograph in 1798 where he examined how the Greek New Testament used the Greek definite article, which in English is the. The definite article in English is the word the. Indefinite English is a. Okay. He examined how the Greek definite article, which in English would be the. In Greek, it's ha or ho. Was used in passages related to the deity of Christ. And he came up with six rules. Are you with me? Six rules concerning how the Greek New Testament used the definite article ha, which in English is the. Okay? In the first rule, pay attention, make sure you get it. Okay? Let me know you get it. And if you're confused, ask me to repeat. The, now, these are rules he discovered. He didn't invent. He discovered how the Greek New Testament uses the definite article, okay? Okay, ban this filthy dog with that name. Filthy dog, born of a dog, okay? Notice his name here. 
Okay, now pay attention to the first rule. The first rule says when you have two personal nouns, nouns that refer to persons, right? Or even participles or adjectives that are personal, refer to persons that are singular and are not proper names. Proper name, a proper name is Tom, John, Tony. When you have two personal nouns, adjectives, participles that are singular, not plural, connected by the Greek word chi or ki, which in English is and. Two nouns connected by the word and in Greek chi, with the first noun having the definite article. In other words, you have the two nouns together. They're singular. They can even be adjectives, adjectives and participles. These two nouns are connected by the Greek word for, for an, chi. And there's a definite article before the first noun only. Then both nouns or adjectives, participles, are referring to the same person. Do you understand? The rule? Two singular Personal nouns. See, Dominus didn't get it. He said proper nouns. See, you didn't get it. No, not proper nouns. Eh, you failed. Two singular personal nouns, meaning nouns referring to persons, or two singular adjectives or partic participles referring to persons, right? Two singular nouns, participles. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Let me write this out. Connected by the Greek word for and. Which in Greek is K or Chi. Or ask me in pronunciation. With the definite article. The. Ha in Greek. Appearing before the first noun. Okay, let me write this out. Two singular nouns, participle adjectives, connected by the Greek word for and, which is chi in Greek, with the definite article the appearing before the first noun. Then both nouns, adjectives, right? Participles. Refer to the same person. You with me there? Latin doesn't have definite articles. You with me there? Do you understand the rule now? If, if someone's confused, let me know. I don't want to move on. Two singular nouns or adjectives, participles, that are not proper names like Tom, Tony, John, but refer to persons. Two nouns connected by the Greek word for and, which in Greek is chi, K-A-I in transliteration, with the definite article appearing before the first noun only, then both nouns refer to the same person. Yes, Jesus would have had to speak Greek in that culture because he had to, a lot of interactions with Gentiles and Romans. Breakfast, you know you're going to be uh, banned for something so stupid. When I just said, now you got some real stupid people here. He and I, those are pronouns. Did I say pronouns? Only an idiot would take pronouns when I said nouns, adjectives, participles. Ban this guy. Sorry, guys. I'm going to be harsh, and I'm going to treat a fool according to his folly. Okay? Okay, now everyone got the rule? If you got the rule, I hope I'm not boring you with this. Because what I'm about to show you, there is no exception in the entire Greek New Testament to this rule. You will not find a single exception to this first rule that Granville Sharp discovered in the entire Greek New Testament. 
Yes, it's a Greek grammar rule. You will not find a single exception to this rule of Greek grammar in the entire Greek New Testament. Are you hearing me? Let me repeat it again. You will not find a single exception to this rule of Greek grammar in the entire Greek New Testament. Okay. Now, how does this apply to Titus 2.13? I want you to look at the Greek because it even provides a Greek trans transliteration. I want you to look at the words to Megelu, to Megelu, Theu, Kai, Soteros, Hemon, Christu, Yesu. Okay. To Megelu. I'm going to spell it out. Go to that link. Okay. Theu, Kai, Soteros, Hemon, Christu. Now I'm doing the Erasmian butchering of the Greek. Yesu. Okay. Did you click on it? There you go. That's the Greek. To Megelu, Megelu, to Megelu, Megelu, Theu, Kai, Soteros, Hemon, Christu, Yesu. Okay. I'm going to post it three times. You see, that's what the Greek is in Titus 2.13. Everyone got it? Everyone got it? If anyone's confused, put a two. Okay. With that said, exactly, Apollo Flex. Okay, now read this. To Megalothiu, Megalothiu is the great God. Do you notice the definite article two? The. Notice the definite article. To the Megalu, Megalothiu. The great God. Do you see the definite article is before the words great God? Do you see it? Now then you see the word Kai. That's the Greek conjunction and. Okay. Then you have Soteros, Hemon, Christu, Yesu. The word Soteros is the word Savior. Savior of us, Christ Jesus. Notice that the word soteros doesn't have the definite article. There is no definite article before soteros, right? So the little Greek is the great God and save, Savior of us, Christ Jesus. Again, literally the Greek is the great God, the great God and Savior of us, Christ Jesus. Okay, folks, notice there's only one definite article, the, and it's before great God. The word Savior has no definite article before it. Which means according to this rule of Greek grammar, the great God and Savior of us must refer to the same person. But notice who that person is, Christ Jesus. So as far as the Greek grammar is concerned, it is inarguable, irrefutable, that the great God and Savior of us has one person in mind, one referent, and that's Christ Jesus. You can't get around this grammatically. You with me there? You can't get around this grammatically. No, it can't. Sunan Abi Dawud. Don't confuse yourself. John 17, 3. Theo says, no, but you will get a job in a minute because you won't be here for long, so you're going to have to be looking for a job. Everyone with me here? You understand? Grammatically, the Greek says, the great God and Savior of us, Christ Jesus. Notice there is no definite article before Savior. The great God, there's one article, and there's that Greek word chi connecting great God with Savior, no definite article before Savior, Christ Jesus. The great God and Savior, Christ Jesus.
Okay. The great God and Savior Christ Jesus. The great God. One article. And Savior. No article. Christ Jesus. According to Greek grammar, the great God and Savior is Jesus Christ. You can't get around this grammatically. Grammatically, since you have two singular nouns that refer to a person connected by the word chi and with the definite article be appearing before the first noun, it has to refer to one and the same person. So when Paul wrote, the great God and Kai, Savior of us, Christ Jesus, he clearly was identifying Jesus Christ as our great God and Savior, which according to the Hebrew Bible must mean that Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh because you can't have any other great God, God besides Jehovah. What, everyone with me there? So how are you going to take 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 to show that Jesus is just a man and ignore what Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, ignore the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2, ignore what he wrote in 1 Timothy 3, if you go to King James, modern English version or New King James, or ignore what he wrote in Titus 2.13, all of which Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, goes out of his way to ascribe to Jesus to describe Jesus in a manner which only befits the true God, Jehovah, because he says things about Jesus and ascribes certain activities to Jesus, which the Hebrew Bible ascribes and describes Jehovah God alone. You with me there? And then if you're still not convinced, Titus 2.13 is calling Jesus God. Titus 2.14. Titus 2.14. The verse right after that. But Theos, since you came let, late, sit back and relax. We're not going to use John to explain Paul. We're going to quote Paul to explain Paul. You just pay attention and follow along. Here's proof that Jesus is the great God and Savior of us all. Because notice what Paul goes on to say in verse 14. Zecho. Hold on, let me, let me muzzle this dog. Okay. Do you see what it says in Titus 2.14? Who, post it, post it again, Titus 2.14. That is 214, one more time. Who gave himself for us, gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So notice it says Jesus gave himself up to redeem us from all sin. So by offering himself for us, he redeemed us from the power of sin, the judgment of sin, and purified us to be his people, a people belonging to him, zealous for good works. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? What Paul just said about Jesus proves that Jesus must be God in the flesh. Because number one, we just saw, according to the Hebrew Bible, God and God alone is able to redeem anyone from their sins. God and God alone is able to ransom anyone from their sins. But beyond that, what he says about Jesus, it says that Jesus ransomed us and purified us for good works, purified a people belonging to him, to him, a peculiar people for him to be his possession, right? And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Now let's go to Exodus 19, 5 and 6 to see the language. Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6. Is that clear or did I put you guys to sleep because we're losing people? I guess that was too much. We lost a lot of people. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, notice language, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now I'm really confused. Jehovah said, I ransomed you, Israel, to be a peculiar treasure for me, a peculiar people for me. I made you my possession, my treasure, my people. But Jesus ransomed the people, cleansed and purified the people from their sin to be his peculiar possession, his peculiar people, his peculiar treasure. Why would Paul identify our relationship to Jesus the way God identified Israel's relationship to him? Israel is God's peculiar people. The church is Jesus' peculiar people. Paul, how could you take the language of God's relationship with his people and apply it to Jesus' relationship to the church when the church should be identified as the peculiar possession and people of Jehovah God Almighty? Why are you saying it's Jesus' peculiar people, Paul? Why would Paul do that? Can anyone tell me? Why would he ascribe to Jesus the language that the Hebrew Bible ascribes to Jehovah and describing Jehovah's relationship to his covenant people? Why is Paul saying that of Jesus' relationship to the church? You guys got it, right? Because Jesus, being our great God and Savior, is Jehovah God of the Old Testament who became flesh Distinct from the Father and the Spirit, but one with them in essence, in power, in glory, in honor, and majesty. That's why. Is it clear now? So much for the misuse, abuse, misinterpretation, misapplication of 1 Timothy 2.5, where the heretics try to use that quote to show that Jesus is but a man, and he's not one in essence with the one God. I hope that argument has been demolished thoroughly by the grace of the triune God, by the grace of Jehovah, Jesus, and the flesh. Because it's late, I won't do a second session, but God willing, I'll do one tomorrow. How about that? Because we already two hours. I can't do a second session. This took longer than normal. Hit the like button. Subscribe. Pass this on to others. Study the arguments. Learn the arguments. And use the arguments against anyone who would dare Misquote 1 Timothy 2 5 again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, our great God and Savior, one with the Father and the Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, forgive us. Please be patient with us. Wash us in your blood. Fill us with your spirit. And Lord, please open the door to release me, to relocate. Please, Lord Jesus. By faith, I know you will. Bless my children, preserve them, fight for them, and bring them to me, Lord. And keep us in love with you. Give us the health we need to serve you and the holiness we need to delight your heart and provide our daily needs. We love you, Lord Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Keep praying for me, the ministry, for my daughters, for my deliverance. And, and Lord willing, I'll be back tomorrow. But do pray for the support. If God has stirred your heart and you know others who have been blessed by this ministry, ask them to partner with me. The Lord doesn't need me. I need him. And if he's going to use me, then he'll provide for our needs, for my needs, through you, his body, for his glory. We love you, Lord Jesus. Take care. God bless. See you tomorrow, God willing.